what's new on the Burlington waterfront. Hey, now it's happening at the waterfront on Lake Champlain. Whatever the weather, there's so much to do on the new waterfront, the Burlington waterfront. Everybody, my name is Melinda Molson, and I'm your host today for On the Waterfront with Melinda. And my guest today is Joy Cohen. Hi, Joy. How are you? I'm doing really great. Thank you, Melinda. How are you? I'm fine. I want to thank you so much for spending a half an hour with me and my viewers to talk about you and to talk <laughs> about your new novel. So let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Um, so Joy Cohen is an award-winning writer educator, yoga instructor, playwright, and you grow and prepare plant-based foods. And these are just a few of your many, many accomplishments. So I wanna talk all about you, Joy, and share with my viewers all about you and your new book. So let's start in Brooklyn. Talk about where you were born. You were born in <laughs> Brooklyn. And tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up. Oh. Well, I was born in Brooklyn, but by that time, my parents, who had grown up in Brooklyn, had already moved to the promised land of the Long, Long Island. So I actually grew up on the island, the first town outside of city limits. So I had kind of the benefit of the, you know, ultra new suburban experience with a 20 minute train ride into the city. And I loved it. I also really longed for quiet and nature. So as soon as I graduated high school, I, it's funny, there's a, the passage we're gonna read today is actually about these vacant lots I used to go to, because I would, I, even in the midst of development, I really longed for nature. And so as soon as I was able, I came up to New England, I went, did undergraduate work at University of New Hampshire and then University of Vermont. I've been in Vermont since 78. Mm. But my childhood was a fairly typical suburban Long Island Jewish <laughs> upbringing. I actually still am very close with the people I went to kindergarten with. We just Zoomed last night. We've been doing monthly Zooms all through COVID. People I went to elementary school, high school with some college. And um, it was a close knit community. It, it seemed it was very kind of in my memory, sort of idyllic, but as you get older and you reflect upon things, you realize the dysfunction of so many aspects, whether it's in your personal life or systemically what was happening. Um, so that, that was kind of the basics of my child. So a typical upbringing. Well, listen, would you, I'm sure that you could share with us the person in your life who most inspired you to become the woman that you are today. Who would you give credit to that? Oh my goodness, that's such a difficult question. I think there were many. Um, well, I had very strong women in my life, my mother and my grandmother. I, I had other grandparents, but I was mostly close with Grandma Eva, who um, was from Poland. And she clearly had such suffered a lot of difficult times, left Poland when she was 17, never saw her family again, you know, had to leave the pogroms and and we never really knew what she had gone through exactly. I mean, we had ideas. So I think her resilience and strength in face of the challenges coming to a new country, not speaking the language, being ex extreme poverty, losing her husband early. Her, my grandpa, Joe, who was her husband, died while my mother was pregnant with me. So I'm named after him. My, my Hebrew name is Josepha. And I never knew him, but he was young. He was 63 when he died. And then she lived till I think in her nineties. So just kind of all of the things that particularly strong women go through and um, just cope with and thrive really. I'd also, I do want to give a shout out to two other things. One would be my teachers. I. I think my teachers were so instrumental in providing me with an idea of what was possible in the world. I'm the, I'm the first of my family, actually, I'm the only one in my family to actually have graduated, gone to college and graduated college. You know, we, my mom was second generation American. And 
they didn't know. They didn't know about academia. And I'm, I'm kind of, a, I call myself a recovering acad <laughs> academic overachiever. <laughs> um, so I, I, I do think my teachers all the way from elementary school, I have incredible um, respect for what they did, the librarian in my elementary school and some really amazing teachers through high school. And then the last part is the community of friends that I was very fortunate to both fall into and nurture from a very young age all the way till today. And I, I don't know where I would be without my friends and my sisters. My sisters are part of that group. And again, a lot of women. Well, it's so interesting because you became an educator. And the, I teachers, did. And the teachers in your life were really instrumental in that. So you, you are an educator and you taught science to grade school children and you also taught at UVM and you are a yoga I, teacher. So you're an educator. And I actually, I'm also, I was certified K-12 science and K-12 art. I spent the last 14 years teaching art at Hunt Middle School in Burlington. Um, I never intended to be a teacher, ever. It was not even part of the things I fantasized. I always, all I really ever wanted to be from a young child was an actress. And I started college as a theater major, but had a change of heart and kind of fell into teaching. I actually was just finishing up my first master's degree in natural resources. And a, I realized I didn't really want to do the computer simulations that were at the time what was being funded. And a high school biology position came up at Middlebury Union High School. I didn't, I wasn't certified, had never taken an education course. But I went, I got an interview and I, I guess I interviewed well <laughs> and they, they hired me. And back then you could get certified by evaluation. So after I had all the science credits, but I didn't have any education, any studies in education, but I was kind of a natural teacher. So after the year of teaching there, I became, I got certified. And I also had a bunch of, I had many, many art credits because I've always been an artist and that's how I got certified to teach art. <laughs> That's so interesting. Um, so talk to us a little bit about some of the work that you've done as a playwright and some of your past works and some of the awards and the recognition that you've received um, because you've done several plays, uh, a few of them you've done at the Black Box Theater. Um, so talk about a couple of your plays that you've done. I, I, it's very interesting, Melinda, I have to say that as I just said, I, I started off life wanting to be an actress, which would be someone that's uh, center stage. And then I became a teacher. So I also was always center stage. very much co comfortable kind of here I am. But over the last decade, I've really transitioned. I'm a writer. I, I spend most of my time alone and creating. So this talking about myself and kind of, you know, is it's, it's funny. I mean, I'm fine with it, but it's not I'm not used to it anymore. It used to be something I craved and I really no longer crave that. You have to do that, but you have to do that and promote because right. I mean, you're a natural. I mean, I'm I think I think there's a little bit of you and me and me and you because I get it. And yet yeah. I'm and yet I'm an introvert. And people will say you're right. not. And I'm like, yeah, but right. I am. Right. Uh, but I see a little bit of us in each other. And so I right. get I get what you're saying. <laughs> but in pr promoting the work that you do, you do need to be out there. Um, so I, I would love you to just talk a couple, sure. a, a few, couple of seconds about uh, the plays that you've written, because this is your first novel. This is your breakthrough novel. This is my debut novel. Debut and novel, I just, but you, you are a playwright, and that ties into your desire to be an actress. Uh, in well, it started off, um, actually, you know, Stu McGowan. He was my business partner. I, I was developing um, a program for the National Science Foundation called the Grow Lab Program. It's teaching hands-on science, uh, science through hands-on gardening. And I had very randomly met this very dynamic man and we were looking for a video producer to do our educational video. So I hired Stu and then we worked together on those videos and decided to start our own video production company. So we, I left teaching, we had our video production company which was all educational videos around the country for places like the Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education and the National Science Foundation. And our, our tagline was videos made for, by, and with children or kids, and which was very unusual back then because this is when you had big video cameras. So we trained kids how to use the video cameras, you know, it was way before cell phones. 
So I started to write the scripts for those. So that's really, that was my entree into kind of this idea of, of writing for camera. And I really had a screenplay in mind. So I, I wrote the screenplay and it's, you know, it's kind of a, I like to dabble. So there were screenplays, there were teleplays, there were theatrical plays. The two that I was very fortunate to have produced at the Black Box Theater, which I love that theater. Thank you for all you've done in Main Street Landing. It's just such an amazing resource to have. Um, the first one was called Anna's Journal. And that was actually, a, I adapted it from a screenplay I wrote. And it's the one screenplay that I am still trying. I want to get it produced as a film. I would love to direct it myself if possible. It's a story that, you know, all of my pieces, pretty much everything I write, go back and forth between two time periods. And I do that on purpose, both because I'm fascinated with different time periods and also I just love to show the parallels between different time periods. It's kind of like, not to get into politics, but when it, <laughs> everyone was so up in arm about our last administration, yes, horrific things happened. But I, as you, lived through Nixon Agnew, you know, when they were very similar, you know, Kent State, all of that kind of stuff. So there's just, there's been a divisiveness. And I think it's important to understand historically that this, has been the way the world has run. And we do then survive and move through it. So Anna's journal takes place in the weeks following 9-11. And it's a story about a young Jewish girl in Vermont, rural Vermont, who has a, a very intimate connection with a young black Muslim teenager. And what their individual story does parallel to the what's happening in the world with Islamophobia and, and you know, everything that happened right after 9-11. In addition, the young man has a, a website, which was also pretty new back then. And he is trying to develop a website about tolerance and human social injustice. And he starts to find out a little bit about Anna's grandmother and through a lot of research and a lot of evidence, he uncovers what he believes is the truth that the grandmother is actually Anne Frank, who never died. And there really is, it, it was all based on real evidence because they never found her body. Um, so there's that's underlying is this fantastical component of the story. So it goes back and forth. And I actually, I'm thrilled. I had to send the screenplay to the Anne Frank Foundation and they gave me permission to use Anne Frank's dialogue in it. So we have scenes of Anne Frank speaking with her, I know I'm getting goosebumps just by looking at you, with her, her di diary with Anna today with her journal and kind of the parallels of that. Fascinating. For my viewers out there, I'm talking to Joy Cohen, who is an award-winning writer, educator, yoga instructor, playwright, and we're going to talk about, we're going to move now into your new novel, your breakthrough novel entitled 37. Here it is. And I want you to briefly <laughs> tell our viewers um, about, about this book um, that you've just released uh, in, on October 1. And it's getting rave reviews and uh, is, high, is highly acclaimed. And I want you to just share quickly with our viewers uh, about your new book, 37. Thanks so much, Melinda. And if I could just, I just really want to quickly also just mention that I was commissioned to write a play about Burlington's lost shul mural. That if people don't know about it, I, I not about just about my play, but about the mural. It's an incredible piece of history, international history that is right in Burlington. And I was incredibly fortunate to be commissioned to write a play. And that was the other play that was at the black box theater so and, we can talk about that <laughs> well and, and i think that they've removed it and restored it and um, right. madeline was involved she called me right. up about it and so yes yes, yes. um that's so i just wanted to make well, sure people you. knew thank you for that sure um well this novel i i don't know how much time i have to kind of give you the backstory well, but you, we have about we have about uh you know 16 minutes left and i know i want oh, you to read geez. something from it Okay. So, and I have a few, I have quite a few other things that I want to cover with you because you're fascinating, but if oh. you go over, I don't care. You deserve <laughs> it. 
you deserve it. So go for well, it. Well, I'll tell you what, we can basically, the novel is about a woman who is at a crossroads in her life. Her, her mother has, she's in her 50s. Her mother had just died the year before. She had a kind of cold and relationship with her mother. Her father, shortly thereafter, came down with Alzheimer's. So he's really not someone she can communicate with. Right after the funeral, her brother, who was her closest confidant, kind of cut her off. She doesn't know why. Her only daughter is living abroad in Spain and her, she is divorced. So she's, and, and her job as a local reporter is feeling unfulfilling to her. So she sets out on a journey to both try to find out what was going on in her family, what was happening with her mother, why her brother has cut her off, and just to try to find herself. And for some reason, she keeps running into characters, events, stories that happened in the year 1937. And she decides, the first one, she decides to write a short story about this particular um, story and the characters. And so embedded in the novel, and it is fairly a unique structure. I, I'm, my publicist is calling this inventive fiction. Literary in fiction. Literary, yeah. literary fiction. Yeah. Oh, sure. Inventive literary fiction combined with contemporary and historical fiction. So let's move, include this in your discussion because okay. that's my next question. And, it, and, and they call it Cloud Atlas meets Eat, Pray, Love. So the, the thread of the novel is a contemporary, like a woman's self-discovery like Eat, Pray, Love. But the short stories are all literary fiction. So there are nine short stories embedded in the novel that take place in different locations around the world. Palestine, because this was 1937, Tibet, Chicago, um, the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and Vermont, and others. And through the, the stories that this woman writes about all of the, the people and their own struggles and their, their resilience and, and the oppression that had happened back then and today, she finds her own truth. And that's kind of the, the basics of what the novel is about. Thank you. Can I ask you, is this somewhat autobiographical? It's a great question. Um, it's not. But it's going to be. <laughs> well, I was, I was wondering whether I was wonder, wondering how, how much of you is inside of Polly. Um, you know, there are there are little snippets, of course, as a as a writer, as an artist. I'm also a visual artist, but as just a, a creative person, I find that the more I stay present, the more I observe. I take in so many aspects of the world that are taken in through my senses. So I'm always aware of the light and how it's hitting something. I'm aware of a snippet of conversation I hear. And I have a pretty good memory for that stuff. And I also keep gobs of notebooks. So the things that come out in the story are certainly pieces of either things that I experienced myself or that I observed. The character herself is not very much like me, although close friends who have read it said oh my god I was cracking up at that part I could just hear you saying that joy and I don't think of that but of course you know I write it so it must be somewhat me <laughs> so, so would you like to read from your book a, a snippet we found a on page 101 um, it would be an honor I'd love it if you could read, a read from your book uh, for my viewers okay. thank you thank Joan. you and this is part of the thread of the novel not the literary fiction in the short stories I made my first pinhole camera when I was about eight. The cardboard, cardboard inserts from dad's dry clean shirts were just the right size. We lived in a new suburban development and I'd go into the nearby vacant lots, the ones that hadn't yet been covered with raised ranch style number three, brick siding instead of wood, and a lawn thick enough to erase the owner's memories of the gray urban past they thought they'd escaped. I'd take my notepad, invisible ink pen, and dad's Lycoflex. He had bought me a brownie fiesta, but I quickly outgrew it. Along with my pinhole, I took artsy shots of weeds growing out of the asphalt or action shots of our pet tabby stalking the crickets. I used to pretend my neighbor, Mr. Goldblatt, was a tribal chief. I wanted to enter the life photography contest with the shot I got of Mr. Goldblatt kissing Mrs. Goldblatt in her floral moo, a real aboriginal moment. 
Mom wouldn't let me. One evening, I hid behind the fence and took pictures of Chief Goldblatt grilling lamb chops in his low-slung cabana shorts. He caught me snapping the camera and chased after me, yelling, Anna Stern, get the hell out of here. I tripped and broke my front tooth on the concrete curb and went home limping, proud to show off my hardcore field correspondent wounds. Mark was ready to go kick some butt and I was ready to follow him, but dad held him back. I couldn't tell if dad was angry with Mr. Goldblatt or me. Mark did a clumsy juvenile war dance and the harder mom tried not to laugh, the louder her snorts became. She looked at him with complete adoration. And as usual, he didn't seem to notice. Mom was oblivious, I was hurt, but it didn't bother me. Blood was still dripping from my chin when I told them, I'm glad it happened, and I was. That was when mom started calling me Polly, short for Pollyanna, Anna being my real name. It wasn't until years later that I realized she was using the name of that sweet, optimistic little girl in a pejorative sense. Dad gave me a copy of the classic for my 11th birthday, the year I was the same age as the fictional Pollyanna. That night, I braided my hair and put mom's eyeliner on my face as freckles. Mom, dad, and Mark were sitting at the table when I theatrically marched into the kitchen, misquoting Porter. When you look for the bad in mankind, expecting to find it, you surely will. Right on cue, mom replied, when you look for the good in mankind, expecting to find it, you surely won't. Oh, Lainey, that's not nice, dad said. It's true though. Mom, Mark admonished. She'd listened to him. In true Pollyanna fashion, I ran over and hugged mom. It's okay, I know you don't mean it. She didn't hug me back. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, Thank share, you, Melinda. so share with our viewers how long it took you to make 37 and what was your inspiration to do so? Was it because you, because of the four years that we endured uh, with our politics that, that had you go back to this time in history? Uh, what was your inspiration and how long did it take you to write it, Joy? Well, what happened was I was going to the Dominican Republic on vacation with my then husband and we went and we loved it and we thought about buying a place there so there's actually a whole story one of the stories shibola um in the book which i i was going down we were going down there and i started to wonder if there would be other jews in the dominican republic which was kind of odd i mean i've been living in rural vermont it's not a very big you know not like i grew up in a in a close-knit Jewish community, but I just started to wonder about it. So kind of what I usually do, I just do some research. And I found this just fascinating story about a community of Jews that had left Eastern Europe when they were being oppressed in before the, the World War II broke out. And at that time, Trujillo, who was one of the world's worst dictators, accepted Jewish, he was the only world leader, Rose, even Roosevelt wouldn't accept Jewish people in, but he accepted Jewish men. And it's a whole longer backstory. Of, and if you read the book, you, well, you know. I did. So and I don't it, wanna... it was basically to breed with the people so that exactly it make them white. He wanted, I mean, it was, he wanted I mean, to lighten, lighten I mean, the just, skin of the just, people. It was just so twisted. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Twisted is the right yeah, word. Twisted. So yeah. I went down, I did interview um, in the book. His name is different, but it was uh, Louis Hess is his real name. And fascinating, beautiful man and spent hours with him. And I was just so blown away by his story that I wrote a short story about it. But as I sat with that short story, of course I did more research into the time period because as a writer, you want to fill in backstory and details. And, you know, again, those sensory details. And the more I found out, the more I was just fascinated by this time period. So that's kind of how it all evolved. That's how it all came to be. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, that's so interesting. Um, your style of writing um, is entertaining, instructive, and illuminating. So do you believe that your training and years as an educator helped you to define your writing style? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, as I said, I'm kind of self-taught. 
education. I went back to school after, after I did my first master's, I went back for a master's in curriculum and instruction. So I did take some incredible education courses. You know, Melinda, it's life. You, you know, w in life, we meet so many people. We, we, I learn from everybody. I mean, some of the most probably informative conversations I've had have been sitting on a park bench and talking to a man in his 80s next to me or on a train, the train from New York to, you know, Rouse's Point, sitting there or to Essex Junction, a nine and a half hour train ride. So I, I it's not, I never really had formal training in it. I think it is just a broad spectrum of being open, of my own travels, of being someone who tries to always think about what if, you know, what did this landscape look like 200 years ago? What did that building, what happened? And you, you probably see a lot of things about architecture in my book, you know, like I, I'm always wondering when you're walking up the stairs, who walked up those stairs? And, and so it's just a lot of, I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly curious person. <laughs> and I think the other thing, I used to say that I'm never bored, but I realized that I'm pretty much often bored. So in order to counteract the boredom, my mind is always imagining things and I'm always, I need to create, I, you know, I paint or I'm fiddling with something. So I think all of those inform it. Um, so Polly is seeking to find her own truth throughout this novel. Did you find your own truth while writing it? I'm still on that journey. Uh -huh. I'm still on that journey. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, there've been a lot of transitions for me personally over the last decade. I, you know, we, life is a bunch of transitions. I know that's kind of just the way it goes, but a lot of loss, a lot of um, change. I've been living alone for the first time in my life. And so it's an incredible gift to, to finally get to know myself because, you know, you go, you grow up and you have relationships and you have friendships and then you have children and you have full-time jobs and you don't most people don't have chance or don't take the opportunity to pause and really know themselves I found um right after my recent divorce I was having a very hard time making decisions and I'm usually a very decisive person and I had a wonderful conversation with someone and through that conversation I realized that I've always it's been so easy for me to make major decisions about my for what was best for my family, what was best for my spouse, what was best for that, but never just what was best for me. So this has been an interesting thing. So I am really trying to find my own truth. I'm not quite there yet, but I'll let you know. <laughs> well, it's so exciting. I can't wait to see what you do next. I mean, quite frankly. So I, I feel like you are truly a Renaissance woman. You have so many talents and passions and you possess an intellectual brilliancy. You are gifted in so many areas. And so if I were to ask you to describe yourself in a few words for our viewers, could you do that? Because you are, are uniquely uh, remarkable um, in all of your gifts. Um, could you do that for us? You're making me get all choked up or as you might know the word, all proclaimed. So thank, thank you, Melinda. It really means a tremendous deal coming from you. Uh, I would say, I use the word curious, and I think that's probably something. I'm, I'm someone that's very curious about life. I'm passionate, very passionate. I like to be engaged in whether it's in my own mind, and but anything creative. And, and that's whether it's experiencing it by doing it hands-on or appreciating others' creativity. And I'm all about connection. I think that's probably the main thing. I like to connect ideas. I like to connect people. And I'm probably missing some things, but that's, you know, I, I, it's just about and about a mutual support. I love a, a mutual supportive community. My My community of my sisters, and by sisters, it's wider. You'll, you're now included in one of those people. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think I think just being reflective, but also being able to connect those truths with others. We have a very short time on this planet. Sure. I'm realizing it, the older I get. And I don't wanna waste time with 
not that I, of course, I feel deeply sadness and loss and all of those things, but that's part of the human experience. And I will get back to it. I think that's one of the things I was trying to do in this was to show that the human condition, no matter who we are, no matter what time period we lived in, no matter where, what culture we're from, we share this human condition of, of just trying to be the best person we can be and create a life that's you know, we lead with love. That's it, to me. That's it's the simple lead with love, lead with kindness, and just do the best we can given the knowledge we have in any moment. Well, what a way to end our interview. So, to my viewers, Joy, thank you so much. Um, stay on after I after we stop recording because I want to chat with you for a few more minutes. But for my viewers who have been listening to Joy Cohen talk about her new her life, her extraordinary life, and her new novel, Thirty Seven. You can get her book at all independent bookstores everywhere. And if you're into shopping local, I suggest you give a call to Phoenix Books. They can send you her book or you can stop in at the store on the several locations here in Vermont at Phoenix Books. Um, so Joy, thank you so much for your time and for this book. And I just can't wait to see what you do next. Um, it's been an honor, Melinda. And I do want to just say, if anyone has a book club, that they, they this is a really great book for book clubs, and I have book club questions, I would be happy to either, if you're local, I'd be happy to come to a, a book club meeting or come in via Zoom. So whatever you'd like. So that's another what a great um, option idea. for people. And let me share your, your website. It's joylisacohen.com. Um, and so go to joy. Cohen's website. And you can also at jernicaeditions.com, which is the publisher of your book, G U E R N I C A editions, E D I T I O N S.com. Um, visit those two websites um, to learn more about Joy and her work and about her new novel, 37. So, Joy, I'm going to go back to our view where we thank can you so together much. so that I can see you. Um, and and thank you for your time. It it I just yeah. I just have loved everything about our time together. And I wish you all the best. I cannot wait to see what you do next. And to my viewers, thank you for tuning in. And I'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you.